Hey, Shalom Israel, Most High in Christ, bless. Welcome to another edition of 15 Minutes with the Captains. I'm Captain Josiah. With me, I have Officer Abraham. So today's lesson is going to be about King James. Okay, who was King James? Was he a white man? Was he a homosexual? Was he into uh, demonology and witchcraft and so forth? These are some of the questions that, you know, Lord willing, we'll get to answer in today's lesson. So no further ado, let's start out with uh, Revelation 12 and 15. This is the book, Revelation chapter 12, verse 15. Come on. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. When you jump up in the chapter, uh, it mentions a, a woman with a crown of 12 stars. This woman is referring to the nation of Israel. Read it one more time. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, mm -hmm. that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. So the same serpent from the beginning casting out water as a flood, meaning lies, after the woman to carry her away. Carry her away from what? This Bible, okay? With lies, philosophies, and so forth. Okay, one of the lies is that this white homosexual that allegedly wrote the Bible, which he did not, uh, you know, would carry the children, as the children of Israel would wake up, they would say, okay, if a white man wrote the Bible, I don't want nothing to do with it. The same white people that carried us into slavery, okay, then we would take the Bible and basically cast it behind our back. Right. So read it one more time. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Uh-huh. So let's get the first book, The Negro Question. Um, one of, one of the lies, uh, that the serpent cast out of his mouth is that they ruled everything for forever, pretty much. Civilization started with them. Okay. We know historically that the Negroes, so-called Negroes ruled Europe and Spain and Scotland and so forth for over a thousand years during the so-called dark ages. We're going to read a little bit of that right now. Read what you got. The Negro Question Part 4 by Lee <clears throat> Cummings, page 8. I know that this image of a black King James can be a little confusing because of your Western education. So we're going to put the image up on the screen. Read it again. I know that this image of a black King James can be a little confusing because of your Western education. Mm -hmm. But this is the truth uh -huh. that is known by the rich and the elite in the world. Come on. King James came from a long line of black Scottish Stuart kings. Of long a long line of black Scottish Stuart kings, right? That's what it said, right? That's right. Read on. 343 years of rulership in Scotland. Mm -hmm. The Stuarts not only ruled in Scotland, they ruled France, Spain, Ireland, and England, Britain, Wales. King James was able to rule all of these lands because mm -hmm. of these people were of Iberian black descent. So all this is talking about the Dark Ages. Okay, again, we ruled those lands for over a thousand years. Prior to the beginning at the 14th to the 17th century, okay, we ruled those lands. They began at the 14th century on up and they began to start whitewashing and so forth of the black images in Europe and Spain and so forth. So get me uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, because it mentioned King James and the term Stuart, right? That, that was a, a surname that they used. Read what you got. First Corinthians chapter four, verse one. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Mm -hmm. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So it's, it's it, read it again, it's what? It is required in stewards. It is required in stewards that what? That it, a man be found faithful. Mm -hmm. So now, it is required that you be found faithful as a steward. That's what it means, okay? These black kings and queens that rule England and Scotland and Ireland and so forth, okay, they were to be found faithful. Now, that's what King James was. Now, give me that uh, first article, um, the Etymology Online Dictionary of the word steward. The word steward, definition. Old English, steward, house guardian, housekeeper. This was the title of a class of high officers of the state in early England and Scotland, mm -hmm. hence meaning one who manages affairs of an estate on behalf of his employer. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what King James was 
commissioned to do by the Most High. The Most High put the spirit on him to employ 47 men to translate this Bible into English. Read on. Steward is a French spelling attested from 1429 mm -hmm. and adopted by Mary, Queen of Scots. That was King James' mother, okay? And prior to that as well, but it says that that term was adopted by Mary, Queen of Scots as a steward. And that's what King James was. So from there, get me uh, the next book, uh, James the First by his contemporaries. Let's uh, start at page 12. Page 12. This king's character is much easier to take than his picture, for he could never be brought to sit for the taking of that, which is the reason of so few good pieces of him. So this is saying, okay, why do we not have many artifacts of King James today? Because what? It, it was hard to get him to sit down and take pictures and so forth. Read it one more time. This king's character is much easier to take than his picture. His character is much easier to take than his picture. Come on. For he could never be brought to sit for the taking of that, which is the reason of so few good pieces of him. So then it's, it's few good pieces of him that actually exist today. Okay. Now, then you have to ask the question, well, why is it that you can Google King James and then all these you know, 30, 40 images of a white man pop up. Right. Read that one more time. That's, that's again, that's the, the water being cast out of the serpent's mouth as a flood to carry away the woman. Okay, read it. This king's character is much easier to take than his picture, for he could never be brought to sit for the taking of that, which is the reason of so few good pieces of him. Right. Is that it? But his character was obvious to every eye. His character was obvious to every eye, but it began to, you know, they began to slander him and so forth. Jump to page 17. We're going to get into uh, a bit of how they explain how he looked. And we're, you know, we're going to dissect it. Read. Page 17. His stature was of the middle size, rather tall than low, mm -hmm. well set and somewhat plump, mm -hmm. of a ruddy complexion, mm -hmm. his hair of a light brown, in his full perfection, and at last, a tenexture of white. His so that means a, a, a small hint of white in his hair. Read on, is that it? His beard was scattering on his chin, and very thin, and though his clothes were seldom fashioned to the vulgar garb, yet in the, in the whole man he was not uncomely. Okay, it says he was not uncomely. He was a comely brother. But it mentioned the term ruddy. Right, Ruddy. Read that part one more time about Ruddy. Uh, where, where was that? His stature was of the middle size, rather tall than low, well set and somewhat plump, of mm -hmm. a ruddy complexion. Of a ruddy complexion. So, uh, another, okay, flood that was cast out of the serpent's mouth was that Ruddy only means red. But we're going to clarify that as we go along. Jump to page 19. Page 19. I dare presume to say you never read in your lives of two kings more fully paralleled amongst themselves mm -hmm. and better distinguished from all other kings besides themselves. Now, this, this was a bishop at uh, King James' funeral. He was actually comparing two kings. It's going to tell you who he was talking about. Read them. King Solomon is said to be the only son of his mother. So, so now he's comparing King Solomon to King James. Read it again. King Solomon is said to be the only son of his mother. Mm -hmm. So was King James. Uh -huh. Solomon, right. Solomon was of a complexion white and ruddy. So was King James. So now it mentions white and ruddy. And then it references uh, Song of Solomon 5 and 10. I want us to get that real quick. Get Song of Solomon 5 and 10. It mentioned white and ruddy. So let's, let's read it and then we can get the understanding thereof. Song of Solomon. Chapter 5, verse 10. My beloved is white and ruddy, mm -hmm. the chiefest among 10,000. Is that it? Yes, sir. Read it again. My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. So it says white and ruddy. White and ruddy. Now jump to chapter 1, verse 5. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 5. I am black. What did Solomon say? I am black. Solomon himself said he is black. This wasn't his nationality, but he's describing his physical appearance. I am black. Read on. But comely, 
O ye daughters of Jerusalem. So now go back to chapter 5, verse 10. Chapter 5, verse 10. My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. So now, what does that mean? If Solomon said he's black, the white and ruddy can't mean white and red. Okay, it means pure. Okay, now I want you to go to the Zonovan Bible Dictionary and I want us to look up the, the word ruddy. Uh, I believe it's page 510. Let's look up the definition of ruddy. A word used to refer to a red or fair complexion in contrast to the dark skin of the Hebrews. Read it one more time. A word used to refer to a red or fair complexion. So it can be used to refer to a red or fair complexion. In contrast. In opposition to what? To the dark skin of the Hebrews. So ruddy, <clears throat> excuse me, ruddy when it's referring to the Hebrews is talking about dark skin, beautiful dark skin. So now let's go back to that uh, James by his contemporaries one more time. Okay, and let's read, let's go back to page 17 one more time. Okay, because it compared, they compared King James to King Solomon and it mentioned white and ruddy. Um, read it one more time. Page 17, his stature was of the middle size, rather tall than low, well set and somewhat plump, of a ruddy complexion, his hair of a light brown. So it mentioned ruddy. Now, the Bible, the Zondervan Bible Dictionary let us know that ruddy is talking about dark skin, referring to the Hebrews, like King Solomon, okay, and King James, as we're going to get into in this lesson. So, from there, officer, get me the, uh, the next article, uh, Black Boy Inn. Let's read that. This is referring to a, a hotel or inn, okay, over there in uh, in England and whatnot. Uh, it's called the Black Boy Inn and we're gonna get some history on that. Why does it have that name? Blackboyinn.com history. There are at least three theories to explain the origins of its name. One relates to a black boy brought into the country on a ship. Mm -hmm. Another suggests it is related to a navigational boy which existed in the harbor in the early days of the inn. Pay attention to this next one, read. And the third refers to the nickname given to Charles II by his mother and the fact that royalists met here secretly at that time. So Black Boy Inn refers to a nickname given to Charles II by his mother. This is the descendant, okay, two lines down from King James. Okay, he was referred to as Black Boy. Do you call a white boy Black Boy? No, I don't. No, nobody does that, okay? Read it one more time, that last part. And the third refers to the nickname given to Charles II by his mother and the fact that royalists met here secretly at that time. Okay, so Charles II, King Charles II, his nickname was Black Boy. Give me the next article on Wikipedia. Wikipedia, Black Boy. Just, just as another reference, okay? Prior to 1828, the pub was known as the Black Boy, mm -hmm. though still referred to by its traditional name, it was officially altered to the King's Arms until a change of ownership led to the restoration of the old name and the creation of the Black Boy Inn mm -hmm. as it is today. Uh -huh. The inn signs each show a black boy on one side and a black boy on the other. So they have actual images on the actual end of a black boy on both sides of it. Read on. The inn's name has caused controversy and there are at least three theories to explain its name. One is believed to come from a black boy which existed in the harbor in the early days of the inn. Mm -hmm. Another refers to the nickname given to Charles II by his mother Henrietta. Mm. Uh, Maria of France because of the darkness of his skin. Because of what? Of the darkness of his skin. Because of what? The darkness of his skin. Charles II was given the nickname Black Boy because of the darkness of his skin. Read on. And eyes, as well as the fact that royalists met at the inn secretly at that time. So now we have, so far we have King James being compared to King Solomon given a ruddy complexion. We know that King Solomon himself said he's black. The Zonovan backed that up with the dark skin of the Hebrews. 
we have a descendant of King James, Charles II, being referred to as Black Boy. Let's move on. Let's get the book, uh, The Age of uh, Louis XVI, right there. Um, the Story of Civilization. Let's start at page 247. Page 247. The character of the king entered influentially into the manners, morals, and politics of the age. This is, this again is referring to King Charles II. Read it again. The character of the king entered influentially into the manners, morals, and politics of the age. Come on. He was predominantly French in, pers in, part in parentage and His education. And education, come on. His mother was French. His father was the great-grandson of Mary. Now, don't get tripped up by French. It's going to clarify as it goes on. Just pay attention. Read on. His father was the great-grandson of Mary the Guise or Lorraine. Add to, add to this a Scottish, a Danish, and an Italian grandparent. He had grandparents and, and, and parents and so forth from these different land masses. That's what it's saying. Okay, come on. And we get a rich but perhaps unstable mixture. Come on. His dark hair. His what? Dark hair. Mm hmm And skin. And what? And skin. His dark hair and dark skin. Come on. Remembered his Italian grandmother. I thought the Italians are white. I guess not. Okay. Like I said, we ruled these lands for over a thousand years. Read it again. His dark hair and skin remembered his Italian grandmother. Give me the next part. When aged 18, he came from Holland to England to fight for his father. Again, this is Charles II, come on. He found time to beget by the brown, beautiful, bold Lucy Walter. By the what? Brown, beautiful, bold Lucy Walter. That's his wife. Okay, the brown, beautiful, and bold what was her name again? Lucy Walter. Lucy Walter. Okay, so his wife also was a so-called black woman. Okay, is that it? Lucy followed Charles to the, con to the continent and served him faithfully, apparently with some now nameless aid. Okay, now, so give me the, uh, the next article. Next article. The next link there. Uh, we're going to look at some, some coins. Okay. Some ancient coins of King James. Now we're gonna put these on the screen, okay? The first one you're looking at is a quarter, okay? If you notice, uh, if you can, you know, zoom in on the right side of the image on the left, it says Jacob there, okay? It says Jacob, okay? The translation of this coin on the front side is Jacob the sixth, by the grace of God, King of Scotland, Okay, on the other side of the coin, it says, Jehovah protects the king. Okay, Jehovah protects the king. So we'll move on to the next, the next uh, link here. And this is another coin. This coin right here actually has King James, King James image on it. Okay, his face. What do you see? A so-called black man with woolly hair. Okay, read, read that. Scotland, James the sixth, after accession to English throne, after the ascension to English throne, crowned, armored, half length figure of King Wright. Okay, oh. it's telling you that it's a half figure of the king himself on the coin. Come on, holding orb and scepter, crown and scepter. That's what that means. A crown and scepter. Jump down. James the sixth, by the grace of God, King of Britain, France, and Ireland. That's what it's saying on the coin, on the outside of the coin. Okay, it's literally saying James the sixth, by the grace of God, King of Great Britain, France, and Ireland. What is it saying on the other coin, on the back side? I will make them one nation. It says what? I will make them one nation. Now, where did King James get that from? That's in the Bible. Okay, I will make them, who is the them? The northern and southern kingdom of Israel. Okay, so now let's move on. Let's move on. What's King James a homosexual? Okay, give me Leviticus 18, 22. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, 
It is abomination. So it's, the Bible is letting us know that it's an abomination for man to lie with a man as he lied with a woman. Okay, if King James truly was a homosexual and he authorized the Bible to be translated, okay, he would have told those men to take all those things out. Okay, he's basically condemning himself in the writings that he authorized to be translated. So why would one do that? He wouldn't. Read it again. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. So now, give me the book uh, Demonology. Under James, the golden age of Elizabethan literature and drama continued with writers such as William Shakespeare, John Donne, Ben Jonson, and Sir Francis Bacon contributing to a flourishing literary culture. Mm -hmm. James himself was a talented scholar, the author of works such as Demonology and Basilicon Duran. Basilicon Duran. So he wrote a book called Demonology and the Basilicon Doron, which means the king's gift. Now, it was demonology about uh, the study of enchantments and how to cast demons on people and so forth? No, it was not. Okay, we, we're going to get into that in a little bit, but uh, is that it? Sir Anthony Weldon claimed uh -huh. that James had been termed the wisest fool in Christendom. So, Sir Anthony Weldon, the same guy that started the homosexual rumor, also said that he was the wisest fool during that whole time period. Come on. An epithet associated with his character ever since. And it became associated with his name, with his character ever since. Okay, the same way the, the homosexuality uh, lie, okay, became attached to him as well. So now, get me James Bye's contemporaries. Let's go to that book. Page 10. Sir Anthony Weldon's character of King James I. So now. The same Sir Anthony Weldon we read about. He called King James the wisest fool. Let's see what he said. Weldon's frustration as a result of his exclusion from office found expression in his treaties on the courts and characters of James I and his successor. Did it mention his frustration? Read that Sir. again. Weldon's frustration mm -hmm. as a result of his exclusion from office found expression in his treaties and his courts and the courts and characters of James I and his successor, mm -hmm. which were published in 1650 and 1651. The general tone of both his straightforwardly gossipy and abusive during the 1640s... Wait, gossipy and abusive? Come on. During the 1640s, Weldon's by now pathological hatred of the Stuarts found expression in more practical activities. So now, it's letting you know that Sir Anthony Weldon, basically he was salty. He got fired from his job or excluded out of office, okay, and he began to make up rumors and lies about King James, okay, to try to get back at him. So now, uh, jump to page 93. Thus far, I have di digressed concerning treasons wherein the knight was pleased to charge King James. The knight that is talking about is Sir Anthony Weldon. It says the knight was what? Was pleased to charge King James, uh -huh. though most unjustly. Though most unjustly, come on. And whereas he says that he did not delight in the queen's company. So it's, it, he started a rumor that he did not delight in his queen's company, in his wife's company. He said, oh, he hates his wife and so forth. He don't like her company, read on. Truly, at that time, they did keep company. Mm -hmm. They had children. So it says they did keep company, right? They had, they had what? They had children. They had children. Come on. One of them was born at Greenwich, mm -hmm. and two of them lie buried at Westminster. So he had some kids that died as well. Come on. Where is their monument at this day? It is true that some years after they did not much keep company together, the king of himself was... So it says they did have trouble in the flesh at some point, okay? Like we all do, but we don't. The king of himself was a very chaste man. It says he was chaste, he was serious. Come on. And there was little in the queen to make him un unjurious. Mm -hmm. Yet they did love as well as man and wife could do. So it, it says there was little in her that could pretty much make him soft. That's what it's saying. He was a serious man and she couldn't soften him up. Read that again about them comp the keeping company, that part again. 
The king of himself was a very chaste man, mm -hmm. and there was little in the queen to make him luxurious. Mm -hmm. Yet they did love as well as man and wife could do. It says, yet they did love as good as a man and woman could love. So there was genuine love and compassion with King James and his wife. Okay, was that it on that? Yes, sir. Okay, so now get me the next book, uh, The Monarchs of Scotland. Let's go there. Let's go there. The Monarchs of Scotland. Give me page 115. Now, a lot of times you can get thrown off by the imagery on the outside of the book, but you got to open it and see what's inside. Page 115. Notwithstanding this, the two got on tolerably well. James fa fathered eight children. How many? Eight children. Read it from the top again, that whole, that whole line. Notwithstanding, this, the two got on tolerably well. It says the two got along and tire, it says what? Tolerably? Tolerably well. Tolerably well. So him and his wife, they did get along well, despite the rumor that King James didn't like spending time with. Read on. James fathered eight children. Okay. Not a bad effort for one supposed to be homosexual. You see that? Not a bad effort for one supposed to be homosexual. Okay. Now, let's move on. The Basilicon Duran. Okay, True Law is that book right there. Okay, give me page 161. Now we're still dealing with the aspect of was King James a homosexual? We've proven that thus far, okay, no, he's not. All right, read what you got. Page, page 161. Come on. But specially eschew to be effeminate in your clothes. This is King James writing to his son. He said, do what? but specially eschew to be effeminate in eschew your clothes. Eschew means to stay away from. To be what? Effeminate in your clothes. Stay away from being effeminate in your clothes. Come on. In perfuming, preening, and, or such like. You see that? Come on. And fail never in time of wars to be gallard, gallardist. Okay. And bravest both in clothes and countenance. It says be brave in your, in your clothes and your countenance. Okay, he's telling his son, don't be effeminate, don't be soft, man up. Read on. And make not a fool of yourself in disguising or wearing long hair or nails. Or, or long hair or nails. So no, King James was not into that homosexual stuff. Long hair and nails and so forth. He's telling his son, don't do these things. Is that it? Which are but ex excrements of nature and be, be weighed such misusers of them to be either of a vindictive or a vain light natural. So now, uh, give me page 137. Page 137. We're closing in or closing out on the aspect of uh, was King James a homosexual? Okay, read on. Page 137. First of all, consider that marriage is the greatest earthly f felicity or misery that can come to a man mm -hmm. according as it pleaseth God to bless or curse the same. Mm -hmm. Since then, without the blessing of God, ye cannot look for a happy success in marriage. It says without the blessing of God, you can't look for a uh, success in your marriage. He's telling his son this, read on. Ye must be careful both in your preparation for it and in the choice and usage of your wife to procure the same. No, your, your husband. Your wife to procure the same. Mm -hmm. By your preparation, I mean... So how, he's teaching them. By preparation, I'm saying what? I mean that ye must keep your body clean and unpolluted till ye give it to your wife. No, your husband. Your wife. He says, keep your body clean and pure until you give it to your wife. Come on. Whom to only it belongeth. Your body only belongs to your wife. Like Christ said, okay, let every man have his own, let every woman have their own. Okay, read on. For how can ye justly crave to be joined with a pure virgin if your body be polluted? You see that? So he's basically saying you can't be a hypocrite. Okay, keep your body pure. Don't be effeminate in your clothing. Okay, perfuming and, and grooming and so forth. Okay, he's teaching his son. You can't teach your son not to be a homosexual when you're a homosexual. It's impossible. You can't do it. Is that it? Why should the one have be clean and the other defiled? Mm -hmm. And although I know fornication is thought 
but a light and venal sin by the most part of the world. Yet remember well what I said to you in my first book, Anent Conscience, mm -hmm. and count every sin in breach of God's law. Wait a minute, he said what? And count every sin and breach of God's law, not according as the vain world esteemeth of it, but as God. You see that? So he said, basically, keep God's laws. Okay, read that part again. Count every sin what? Yet remember well what I said unto you in my first book, Anent Conscience, and count every sin and breach of God's law, not according as the vain world esteemeth of it. Don't count sin lightly like the world does. Keep God's laws is what he's saying. Be serious about the Most High's laws. Come on. But as God, the judge and maker of the law, accounteth of the same, hear God commanding by the mouth of Paul to abstain from fornication. Wait a minute. So now he's quoting Paul to abstain from fornication. Go ahead. Declaring that the fornicator shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. First Corinthians 6 and 9. He's quoting Paul, letting you know that fornicators will not inherit the kingdom. He's teaching his son this. So no, King James was not a homosexual. Okay, now we're gonna to touch on, was King James a witch? Okay, he wrote a book called Demonology. Does that mean he was pushing, uh, you know, enchantments and witchcraft and so forth? Okay, let's read. Exodus chapter 22, verse 18. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. This goes back to was he a homosexual? Now, if he authorized the Bible to be translated, this, the law says, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. And he told his son to keep God's laws and don't esteem God's laws like the vain world does. Okay, keep the laws in high esteem. Read it again. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. So that's in the King James authorized version. Do not suffer a witch to live. So now, give me the book, Demonology. Let's actually dive into the book a little bit and let's see what King James wrote about. Page five, whereof the one called Scott, an Englishman, is not ashamed in public print to deny that there can be such a thing as witchcraft. He said he's not afraid to deny that you cannot be a witch. There can be no such thing as witchcraft under God's laws, read on. And so maintains the old era of the Sadducees in denying of spirits. They're saying he said that because he's, he's denying spirits exist like the Sadducees, but that's not true. It's going to clarify. Read on. My intention in this labor is only to prove two things, mm -hmm. as I have already said. The he, one he said, he said, I want to prove two things. The one what? That such devilish arts have been and are. They, he says those devil, he's, he calls them devilish arts. Right. Demonology is a devilish art. They have been and they are. Okay, come on. The other, what exact trial and severe punishment they merit. S severe what? Trial and severe punishment they merit. So he said when you're into demonology, okay, and witchcraft, you deserve severe punishment. Like the law says, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Give me the next page. Page 92. Page 92. But to answer generally to such, let this suffice. That first it is well known that the king is the child and servant of God. The king is the what? The child and the servant of God. He's talking about himself. I'm, he's a, the child and servant of God. Come on. And they but servants to the devil. And they, meaning those that uh, are witches and, and studying and, uh, demons and so forth, they're servants of the devil. Come on. He is the Lord's anointed. Uh -huh. And they but vessels of God's wrath. Come on. He is, the, he is a true Christian and trusted in God. It says he is a true Christian. He's a follower of Christ and trust in the Most High. Come on. They worse than infidels. For they only trust in the devil, who daily serve them, till he have brought them to utter destruction. But hereby it seemeth that his highness carried a magnanimous and undainted mind, mm -hmm. not feared with their enchantments. It says what? Not feared with their enchantments. He's, he's not feared with their enchantments. The scripture says there's no enchantment against Jacob. Okay. King James understood that. Read on. 
but resolute in this, that so long as God is with him, he feareth not who is against him. You see that? So no, the book Demonology was not about pushing witchcraft and so forth. Was King James a witch and into demons and so forth? Absolutely not. He told his son to keep God's laws and witches and demons and so forth, they deserve severe punishment. So Lord willing, y'all got something out of today's lesson. Uh, with that, we say Shalom. Shalom. Daniel of Israel United in Christ. Please subscribe to our YouTube channels. Stay up to date with our latest events, music, and classroom lessons. IUIC plans to continue visiting different countries where this gospel has not been preached before. IUIC needs your help in pushing this truth. So join us, subscribe to our Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and podcast, and stay up to date with us. For more information, please visit www.israelunite.org.